Lovely, perfect, good to have you back. Let's continue and let me remind everybody about this little tradition that we have. I mean, we have several of them here at Code Dive, but one of them is always a very strong representation from the Netherlands visiting us here. So let's do it properly. If you come from the Netherlands, by the way, the country is no longer called Holland. It's been renamed or back back to the Netherlands recently. So if you are from the Netherlands, make some noise. Now, if you are not from the Netherlands, make some noise for Dutch people. And then Dutch people, we just uh, all about facts and figures here. So I'd like to actually test if you are from the Netherlands indeed. So on my count, could you all please do the <laughs> sound, okay? One, two, three. Pass. Thank you. Let us move on with our agenda and our next speaker is Andrzej Krzemieński. Now, Andrzej is one of the founding fathers of Code Dive. He's been with us from year one. Actually, some people say that Andrzej is a Code Dive stalker, which is a little bit concerning, really. Anyway, apart from his stalking hobby, Andre has been practicing coding since 2004. He works mainly with C++ and commercial software, which includes safety-related and high-performance systems. He's a member of the C++ Standard Committee and a Boost developer. He's also a co-organizer of the C++ user group in Kraków, and he's known to the community for his blog on C++. Now, Andrzej says, so in his own words, he ended up as a software developer because, let's face it, it is the easiest way of making some decent living with no social skills. Andrzej Krzemieński. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. My name is Andrzej Krzemieński. I work for Saber Polska. And now uh, we are resuming uh, the talks on C++ uh, coroutines. So you have a demo of coroutines in real life. Uh, we suspended for lunch. Now we are resuming. Andreas told you uh, before the break how you implement the library part uh, of the coroutines. And now we're going to see how you will use coroutines to solve uh, practical programming problems. So uh, our task today will be to write a TCP, uh, yes, a TCP eco server that is able to uh, service multiple connections at a time. Eco server means uh, that uh, the client is uh, sending characters to it and the server is sending those characters back. So you might question the practicality of this solution, but this is a hello world example of uh, server applications. If you can do that, you can build everything else uh, on top. In order to implement this, we will use the Boost ASIO library. ASIO stands for Asynchronous Input Output. It is a, a decent, uh, stable, baked, uh, robust library, quite popular, well documented. Uh, and I, being a, a Boost developer, of course, I, I have my share in uh, promoting it. It's been written by Chris uh, Kolhoff. It's been with us for almost 17 years. And uh, we'll use it because it provides its uh, model for asynchrony, which we'll learn. It provides uh, uh, protocols, uh, the ability to service the protocols like TCP IP out of the box. And it provides a uh, experimental uh, support for coroutines. So uh, the plan is to first talk a bit about asynchronous computations in general, then we'll implement the TCP eco server uh, using C++11, and we'll use a lot of lambdas there because it's the, the best way. 
uh, and then we'll try to do the same uh, uh, TCP server example, but using C++ 20 coroutines. And we'll do it all in 40 minutes. OK, so uh, before we go asynchronous, let's uh, uh, check the main points of uh, synchronous computations. The main idea beh uh, behind the synchronous computations is that when operation A needs to call some operation B, it will suspend and will, will need to wait until B has finished, which means that if B takes a lot of time, operation A will take even longer. And only then can we proceed to doing next operations. This is different than uh, asynchronous computations. In asynchronous computations, when you can afford it, that is when operation A isn't interested in the results of operation B, it can just launch it on the site, just fire and forget it, and never return to it again. And this takes a very short time. We can immediately move on to operation C and subsequent operations. The operation B will run maybe concurrently, maybe not, maybe sequentially, but sometime at some time later. We no longer care. And this is ideal solution for implementing main server loop, for example, because where we need to keep uh, uh, looking at our request queue to see if something is there. We need to do it fast. If something is there, we launch a session with the client. The session may take seconds, minutes, we don't know. But we, we don't have to wait for it. It will be done uh, by other thread or somehow by someone else. And we move on to, the, uh, to checking if there is uh, next incoming request in the queue. And now, uh, another important part uh, is the how we handle errors. In case of a sequential code, uh, usually what you do, or actually always what you do, is where when you have uh, operation B that fails and you have subsequent operations that depend on it, on its results, you cannot execute them. Because the precondition on calling operation C is that uh, B has succeeded. If it didn't succeed, we have to skip C. If we skip C, the entire operation A is considered fail. If it's failed, we need to skip uh, the operations that follow. And this is wh what it is. The error, uh, yes, error fa failure handling is skipping uh, dependent operations. This is what you do, uh, this is what exceptions do, for instance. They skip operations. And if you don't use exceptions, if you use if statements and uh, early returns, you are implementing manually the same pattern here. And in case of asynchronous computations, it's different because we do not, uh, operation C, like here, is not interested whether B succeeded or not, because maybe it hasn't even started yet. So should the B fail, nothing uh, of the other stuff is skipped. That is not to say we are completely ignoring errors that there might be, but those errors, we may say apologies to our clients, but those errors do not affect other operations that need, still need to be executed. Well, that's it for the intro. Now we are implementing the uh, eco server in C++ 11 and Pustatio. So our, the architecture of our program will be that will uh, keep listening on incoming connections. So the, the word keep implies that there is going to be some sort of a loop. And then for each uh, connection that we establish, we start a session, which means keeping repeating the user input. So it's another loop. And let's start implementing it. In Boost Asia, we have to use this IO context. This is uh, all the machinery for uh, running, registering and running asynchronous tasks. You have to uh, have at least one of those I.O. contexts in your application, in, uh, in the networking TS, if you are familiar with it, it would be called uh, executor. And the most important part that it has is the task queue. And actually, in this model for concurrency, to launch a, a asynchronous task means to put a task into a task queue. And it will be wait, uh, waiting there at, until the library picks it up and executes. 
once we have it, we are ready to uh, put the first task into the task queue. We create a listener, we'll see uh, in, in a moment uh, what it does, but we are just creating a class object. It's a very cheap operation. There, there's not, no listening going on just yet. Then we call the function call operator, uh, which I, I defined, we'll see it in the next slide, and the only thing it does, it is actually here in this operator that it, we will put the first task into the task queue. And the task is not being processed yet. We are just putting initial tasks, so it's a very cheap operation, just put the uh, element into the container, and it waits there uh, until the main server loop starts. This is the time now to uh, insert next initial tasks, because we may have more. In a real application, we would have another task that listens for a quit operation, if we want to quit the server. But this is a short example, so we will skip that part. And once we have uh, put all the initial tasks into the task queue, we can start the main server loop. And we do it by calling function run on this IO context. At this point, our execution is suspended here, and the thread is now used to process tasks from, the ta from this task queue. And the effect of processing these tasks may be putting next tasks into the queue. So this is our loop. And in fact, I am uh, implementing a single-threaded asynchronous server. I could have used more threads. In that case, I would have to call function run on this IO context for, from more than one thread. This would mean that, uh, that there would be three threads uh, processing the task queue. But in order to do asynchrony, you don't have to have multiple threads. And now, uh, uh, now all the fun begins. Now let's go to see what the listener is. Listener is abstraction that I created in, in this program. And in the implementation, I am using the library component called Acceptor. Acceptor, uh, as you can see, it's TCP Acceptor. It knows everything about the t TCP protocol. I will just pass it the port number on which I want to listen and the IO context because everything that, wa that wants to do asynchronous operations needs to have a reference director in direct to this I.O. context, because this is where you put the next tasks to be executed asynchronously. And then uh, our function call operator calls function, again, a function from this class, async except one. In the implementation, I call the first actually the first uh, asynchronous function uh, in this program. This is this async accept. Async accept will be put, th this function returns immediately because it's asynchronous. So the, the synchronous part is just to put a task into the task queue and return. So this function will uh, return momentarily, but we have a task uh, uh, in the task queue that will accept the connections. When it is executed, it will wait for incoming connection. And at some point, this uh, connection will be established, and we will get a socket. But because it is asynchronous, the question arises, who will know about it? Because not us. Our function is, uh, is done already. So the only uh, thing that will be informed about the success, uh, successfully established connection is this callback that we pass into the function. Uh, in, in this library, we call it a completion token. And we have to provide one. This is where we provide the logic of our server. So once the connection is established, we have a socket, this is invoked. Completion token gets the error code because there might have been some errors. And uh, in case of success, we get the, uh, the socket. And we have to tell the, uh, actually implement the business logic, tell what, what uh, it has to do. So we check if there was any error. If there was no error, we just launch a new session asynchronously. We'll see in a moment what it does. Otherwise, we report an error. But to report an error is actually to write something into the log file. We, we cannot do anything else. And otherwise, we are ignoring the error. Because as we said, uh, there is no one to actually uh, inform 
uh, about the problem in case of asynchronous computations. And then what we do, and this is the fun part of, of this library, we call async accept one again. And uh, so, so this will uh, initiate the next uh, listening for, for the next incoming connection. It may look like a recursion here, but it actually isn't. The, the way you are supposed to read it is you async uh, accept or for, one, uh, for one connection, and when it is done, uh, only then call a callback, and in this callback it will be done later because it's asynchronous, so this callback will be called sometimes later. Only it will call our function again. So we have to make sure that because it will be at some point, a uh, uh, later point in time, we have to make sure that this listener that we've created is still alive. I in this case here, we guarantee it because we have created it in, in function main before the main server loop, so we are guaranteed that it will be alive for the entire duration of the main server loop. And th with this, I will call it a pseudo recursion. We guarantee that there will be next, uh, we'll be waiting for the next connection and then for the next and for the next until uh, this is uh, uh, someone kills our server. Oh, sorry, not, the, not this direction. Now it is the same example, but I use the lambda as people often uh, use those lambdas. So I put it directly into the function call. So it's the same async accept, and the completion token here is this lambda. And we can run a, a simulation, simulation in the PowerPoint to, to show you how uh, asynchronous computations are invoked. Uh, we call async accept, and at some point it will really be executed, and our and we will uh, establish a connection, uh, and this will be represented by the socket. Then we will call our completion uh, token uh, with the socket. I immediately the socket is there, ready to be read from and uh, written into. We check if there was uh, an error, there is none. We launch another asynchronous task, wi which is uh, our session, which we'll see in a minute. Then, uh, because we are calling uh, this function again through this pseudo recursion, we launch another async uh, accept, uh, ready to accept the new connection. When it actually accepts the connection at some later point, uh, it uh, creates another socket for us and calls our completion token again. We can launch another session, and through this pseudo recursion, we go back, launch another, async accept, and you can see that this uh, uh, we are building forks and some sort of a tree. Of course, at this point, those uh, previous uh, tasks will have been executed, so they will have been removed from the queue. And this time, we get an error. Something w went wrong when establishing a connection with, the, uh, with our client. We need to skip the creation of the session. We need to report an error. But you might ask, if the, there is uh, an error and there was no connection, there surely is no socket to be worked with. So what does this socket, uh, uh, is this socket doing here? Now, uh, this is the consequence of the design choices that the library authors took. That you always get the, this value that you are supposed to get on a success and an error, and the contract is you have to first check if there was an error, if there was an error, you are not allowed to read from this object. In this case, it is a socket. In case of other async operations, this would have been a different object. But all of those objects have a null state, which is initialized when, when there was an error. The library could have gone uh, with a different choice. Maybe it could have used a variant here of error or, an, or socket. Or maybe it could, could have used two callbacks, one for success, one for the error. But the choice is this. We have to live with it. And uh, success or not, we'll maybe we skip the session, but we are still doing the recursion, and we are uh, launching another asynchronous task, and this is how the loop, the main server loop, moves on. And there is one other control flow that is not obvious here. It is possible that 
or maybe put, uh, let's put it this way, each async operation has this uh, uh, synchronous part. The synchronous part is to put a task into a task queue. This is what happens synchronously. Only then the other, uh, the, the, the remainder is asynchronous. But even putting a task into the task queue may fail, because the queue may be full, or, or a similar re reason like this. And if, the ta if, uh, if this happens, obviously it will not be invoked asynchronously, there will be no callback uh, that will be able to learn that something went wrong. In this case, an exception is thrown from this function async accept, which informs us that there, there is no longer a way to schedule the next asynchronous task. And this will break our uh, server loop. OK, now let's see what uh, the session does here. First thing we do uh, in our uh, function session is to create a state. Because the session will be a sequence of reads and writes from the socket, and uh, they will be done asynchronously, and they all have to share some data. This data will be a socket that they operate on, and the buffer, the buffer where we read data uh, in, and then the, the, from the same buffer we will uh, send this data uh, back to the, uh, the socket. So th those reads and writes will be done at some unpredictable times in the future, and we have to guarantee that they all observe the state, that the, st that the state lasts longer uh, than the, uh, until the last task uh, uh, here is finished. And we cannot predict how many of those tasks are, because the client may want to type something forever. So we cannot predict ahead of time uh, where this will end. This is why we need to heap allocate this uh, state and then control its lifetime through shared pointers. So each task will, will be given a shared pointer to this object, and this is how uh, we will guarantee that the, that the state lasts uh, long enough. And uh, because uh, TCP is half-duplex uh, protocol, you cannot do reads and writes at the same time. They have to occur in sequence. And because of that, I could have gotten away with shared pointer. I could, I could implement it with a unique pointers and then some row pointers, and it would also work, but I cannot get away with one heap allocation. This is inevitable in this model where you put tasks into the task queue. So I have functions you can see read and write there, and now the, I just need to call them in the right order. So I start with the function read, I pass it the shared pointer, and this is how function read looks like. I call another asynchronous function. Like on a socket I call async read sum. It needs a buffer. So it, it, I will put it into the task queue, it will wait there until it is executed. When it is executed, it will fill my buffer with the data, and it is ready for me to see this data. How do I see this data? I need to pass a completion token again, this callback here, or lambda in my case. Once the data is fed from the socket buffer into my buffer, uh, I can inspect it. I get the the number of bytes read, and the error code, in case, if, in case there was an error. Uh, I have to now implement it. Note uh, that I pass this shared pointer here by, I capture it by value. This is how I prolong the lifetime of this object. And then the body is, I check if there was an error. If there was no error, I just write back what I got in this buffer. If there, wa uh, there was an error, I need to distinguish two situations. Because th the way this library uh, represents the end of transmission, when the client decides it, uh, they have nothing else to send, it is also represented by an error, by this end of file. So I need to treat it specially, because it, conceptually, for me, it's no error. If this is the case, I'm not reporting it. Otherwise, I am reporting an error. But whether I report it or not, my function ends there. The sequential part uh, uh, and there, there is nothing more to do. Anything more to do is in the function write that I just called before. And now the function write looks somewhat similar. I call another uh, asynchronous function, async write, which means I'm just putting a new task into the task queue. It needs a socket. 
it needs a buffer from which to read the data and put it into a socket. And when this has been done, it will invoke my completion token again. The completion token, I again prolong the lifetime of a shared pointer. I check if there was an error. If there was any error, I will skip the read. Otherwise, I am ready to do the next read. And again, it may look like I'm implementing strange recursion here. I'm calling read from inside the write, but I actually don't. I'm actually not doing it. It means that after a successful asynchronous write, perform a read. This is how you are supposed to read it, even though it's not obvious. So if we want to depict it, this is how it would look like. Function read in the completion token initiates asynchronous write. Function write, when it's done, initiates a successful read. Again, the read in the uh, completion token may execute the next write. So with those tools, I managed to somehow emulate a loop or, some, or something uh, like a loop. And this loop is broken whenever I get an error. And if we add this accepting of connections into the picture, we have uh, this, that each successful accept of a connection actually spawns two new asynchronous tasks. One is to start the first read, and the other is to start the new accept. And this forks and forks. We can see the main server loop. is the sequence of uh, accepts. And we can see the sessions. I mean, conceptually, because from the library perspective, perspective sorry, it's individual tasks. But we conceptually know that there are sessions, and for each session, we need to guarantee the uh, scope of its state. And that's it. We've implemented the uh, uh, eco server in ISO. Now uh, we're doing the same with uh, coroutines. Our function main looks very similar. We create the IO context where the task you will reside, then we create the listener. Again, we pass it the port number and IO context, but this time it returns an awaitable object. Awaitable, as you can see, has been defined in this library. It is a class template defined by the, provided by the ASIO uh, library. So you've been told that uh, working with coroutines is hard, but uh, this hardship is for the library implementers. They've, they've done their hard part, and we are just consuming their work. So it, it's going to be simple, under some definition of simple, of course. We get an awaitable. Awaitable is, uh, in short, something that you can call co-await on. This is a new operator. Uh, uh, in a C++ 20, but the good news is you don't have to call it. The library will call it. Your job is just to create it. Uh, so we create this awaitable, we'll see how in a minute, and then we call another library function. This also uses uh, co underscore, but this is just a function from the library, and it is used to put a task into the task queue. Previously, uh, but now, because we have awaitable, awaitable is different type than before, so we need this different function so that it adapts the interface of awaitable into its own internal uh, interface of those tasks. So if we are do doing some adaptation here. Otherwise, we, we're just putting it into the task queue. So there is no listening executed just yet. We are just putting a task into the task queue. And uh, uh, this ASIO detached is a completion token, because every async call need, needs to have this uh, completion token. This detached means it is a no-op. You, you don't do anything uh, uh, in a continuation. Any, any job will be done inside the listener. Once we are done with uh, uh, putting this task into the task queue, we start the main server loop by calling this function run. And now the, the fun is inside the function listener. But before we go there, the question is, if we are returning uh, an awaitable, is this listener a coroutine or not? 
and uh, actually Andras spoiled all the fun because uh, we've already seen in the previous uh, talk that from just looking at the declaration of this listener, it takes arguments, returns avoidable, we cannot tell uh, whether it, it is a coroutine. It could, uh, can be just a factory function, it can be a forwarding function. We have to pick inside and only then we'll know. And if we pick inside, indeed, uh, we can see the co keyword, which means we are in a coroutine and uh, strange things happen there. First thing is, uh, as we've seen before, that we have a return statement, uh, the return type, but, not, but no return statement, which would have been undefined behavior if this was a normal function, but it is not, it is a coroutine. So actually, even though we cannot see it, compiler does its magic. This is not only uh, awaitable that uh, ASIO library provides, but it also specializes the coroutine traits. So the compiler takes all those uh, argue, uh, return type function arguments, puts them in order, and runs it through coroutine traits to see what happens. And the, this library specializes coroutine traits, so we get some promise type. From this promise type, we get the object type, we return it. And this is actually the only thing that this de definition of the function coroutine is doing. It's only returning th that. No other code is executed. But the good uh, news is that you don't have to know about it, of course, until you start debugging the problem, uh, because it is all done behind your back. So this is the, the idea behind coroutines, is to not pay, uh, focus on the asynchronous code. The synchronous code is hidden, and uh, what you see in the body is this asynchronous part. And uh, uh, as we said, no, uh, nothing there is executed. Not even this uh, uh, construction of acceptor is uh, even executed. This function re immediately returns, uh, you cannot even call it a function because of coroutine, but what happens, the invocation of listener immediately returns this return object, the function mains get it, it puts it into the task queue, and only when the main server loop starts, the task, when it executes the task, the first task, it will uh, execute this function. Only then we will create the acceptor, start the for loop. Sorry for this for try expression, I just need to, to squeeze a lot of code into the slides, but it's normal try catch block inside the for loop. I launch the first loop iteration, I call function async accept but pass it different arguments than before. Now I'm passing it this a show use awaitable. It's a tag type. It means it's empty type and its only use is to control the overload resolution mechanisms, which means I'm selecting a different overload of async accept. This overload does nothing else but to return another awaitable object. It returns awaitable object. This is a cheap operation, nothing is listened Nothing, nothing asynchronous uh, takes place yet. I just get this awaitable, and then I call co-await on it. And this is where the magic happens, because at this point our coroutine is suspended, and the control returns uh, uh, back to the uh, ASIO engine, which will now, because it has the access to this uh, new awaitable, which will know that it has to listen for the new uh, incoming connections, at some point, it will establish a, a connection, and when it does happen, my function is resumed here with a socket ready to be read from. And th this works because the signature of this uh, async accept overload uh, returns an awaitable socket. So co-await, apart from suspending my function, also unwraps this uh, awaitable socket into a socket. So awaitable socket means that at some point you will get a socket, but you have to co await on it. Now let's run a simulation to, to give you an intuition of, on how it works. We'll see in the upper part we have the old uh, C++11 code with lambdas, in the lower part we have the coroutine uh, version. They do exactly the same, but uh, using a different uh, notation. 
we start here with uh, calling async accept. And in either case, uh, we put a task into the task uh, queue, which we will accept for incoming connections. At some point, the connection is uh, really accepted. We get to a completion token, and the completion token receives a initialized socket. In the upper case, uh, to receive uh, to a completion token means running a lambda. In case of coroutines, completion token is a the uh, reminder of, of the coroutine body or the instruction just after the co-await. And we move on. We start uh, our session asynchronously. In either case, it's almost the same. Maybe a different co-spawn, which we will get back to in a second. But we launch our session asynchronously. And then, in the upper case, we use this pseudo-recursion. In the coroutine case, we're using a normal for loop. Uh, we are back ready to do the next async accept. So we launch another asynchronous operation, which you can see that there is a fork here. We don't necessarily have two threads processing it. Even one thread can process this queue because there will be those tasks will be ordered somehow. Uh, we are accepting a new connection. At some point, it will actually work. And this time, we will get an error. Something may, might have gone wrong. In case of uh, uh, Lambda implementation, we have to inspect the error code and manually skip the creation of a session. In case of coroutines, the exception is thrown from the co-await uh, operator. And we can use the normal try-catch uh, syntax to catch this error, handle it, where handling means actually ignoring it, and uh, we move on to the next uh, Mm, asynchronous, uh, I mean, the next iteration of this server loop, which is, again, to uh, asynchronously accept and maybe to launch a session. Now, we can see that there is another awaitable here. And in fact, there are more. Another one is here in the session. We are actually creating, in, in this very function, two new awaitables. But, as you can see, we are, using, uh, we are consuming them in a different way. In the first case, we just called co-await on this awaitable. In the other case, we called this call spawn function. And to understand this, we have to go back to our control flow here. We said that uh, our, when we accept a connection and run the completion token, we are actually doing a fork. One asynchronous operation starts a session, the other one starts a new accept. Now the Coroutines have the ability to turn asynchronous uh, operations into a synchronous flow, but you can only do it for one asynchronous operation at a time. We have to, you have to decide which one it is. In this case, I decided that the creation of, of next accept uh, operation is the one that I will represent sequentially. And the effect is that I can represent a loop of the, a sequence of uh, accepting connections as a for loop. For the remaining ones, which is one in this case, I am still doing normal uh, asynchronous call, as I did before by executing a function. And uh, a, a consequence of it is, I'm using a normal, uh, at least for, for the sequence of accepting, of accepting new connections, I can use normal uh, idioms from uh, regular C++ sequential code, like RAII, for loops, and uh, try-catch. But because I am still running my session asynchronously, any error or exception thrown within the session will not be caught here. This is still the normal asynchronous part, which will have the, its own error handling implemented inside. So this catch here is only for the sequential part, for a normal sequential part, and this emulated, or the new sequential part that I emulated with this co-away. Now uh, we'll see quickly how the, our session is implemented. This is 
another coroutine because it uses a co-await keyword. Again, it, it returns an awaitable. And here we have a normal for loop and a sequence of calls to async read sum and async write. So we just uh, read, write, read, write, uh, which looks at least gives you an impression that we are actually doing a loop. A loop is uh, represented directly by a for loop statement, but the most interesting part here is how I represent the state of this uh, session. I'm using, uh, the, I'm passing socket by value. Uh, it's just a function argument, or a coroutine argument, if you want to call it. They behave, uh, they behave somewhat different because the coroutine needs to copy them and I represent the buffer as a normal automatic variable. And it will last even though under the hood, if you looked into the implementation of the boost A show, it's still tasks that are being put into the queue at random moments. But they still, all of them, has access to this state, to the, to the socket, to the data, or, uh, as long as the last read or write uh, is registered. And uh, you might ask, if this happens at the random moments in the unpredictable future, how is the compiler guaranteeing that those objects will, will be alive? And the compiler does that by allocating the state of the coroutine on the heap. It takes all the function arguments, copies of or moves or, of uh, function arguments, uh, all the automatic variables plus some uh, other state where we stopped, and it stores them in one heap allocation. Now, this might sound disturbing, like this is C++, we are uh, interested in efficiency, and yet we are doing a heap allocation behind the user's back. But note that I could not implement it better. My manual implementation before also needed to use the heap allocation. Uh, this uh, allocation actually caused the coroutines to be delayed in the standard. They were postponed for a couple of years, in fact, because people were concerned about this allocation. But it is still considered a zero overhead abstraction because you cannot do it better yourself when you are using, when you are using those tasks, when you are using this asynchrony model uh, yourself. You still need to allocate. So it is no worse than any manual solution that you can come up with. But there are benefits. The compiler will do the management of the memory better than you. You don't have to use any reference counters, no shirt pointers, no manual uh, uh, control over the memory. It will do it all for you. And it will be probably more efficient, and in some cases it can even optimize. And that's it. We implemented the server. We can just run a short comparison. On the left hand, you have the, the, the old implementation with the lambdas. On the right hand side, you have the coroutine ones. The function main is somewhat similar. The difference is, in, for instance, in listener, because in a coroutine word, I could have my acceptor as a normal automatic object, whereas before I had to create a class with a state, with the members, which I have to initialize separately. And I have to do this uh, pseudo recursion to reflect the fact that I have a loop. In the coroutine word, I have a loop expressed with a for loop. <laughs> the, the situation is even uh, worse in case of a session, because I need to put a lot of boilerplate code to efficiently manage this state. So I have to group all this, all this data that I will need into one cl uh, in class, control it. How much of this, uh, of this code is only to do this manual memory propagation, then I have to make sure that those are passed by value, whereas here I can just use automatic variables and uh, function arguments. And also, there is no single place to reflect a program logic. Like, I have function read, which does something and then calls write. If you need to debug this program, you will get to this task that is executed. You, you don't even know who called it. I'm executing some uh, read. Maybe there are many places that put this task into the task queue. Instead here, if you even have to debug the code and you get there, you know the entire context. Because here, our session is expressed as one function with its state and all the sequence of operations that we call. Right? Owing to this, we can 
express our algorithm directly in the code. Yeah, this is a, again a function write that goes read. And uh, but the biggest benefit that you get, and this is the main point actually of this talk, is the a coroutine is a series of callbacks with a single lexical scope where you, you can just put your variables. And that's it. We're done. Uh, thanks for your attention. Those uh, examples uh, that we've seen are actually examples from the Boost Asia library. So I modified them uh, uh, quite a bit to fit into the presentation, but uh, it is uh, pretty well documented. Again, thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, if there is any questions, maybe we can take them. Andrzej Krzemiński. I think we've got time for one or two quick questions. Anyone interested? Yes, there's one question over there, please. So, Andrzej, if you'd like to stay for five more minutes just to answer one or two questions. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, not sure if my question is, is in the scope of the talk, but... Uh, you essentially demonstrated how coroutines can be helpful in implementing a sequential flow of things that would otherwise happen asynchronously. But they're still sequential. I am only doing one thing at a time for my session, for example. My, my logical scope being this session. But what if I'm doing many things at a time for I'm waiting for many things that can happen at various points? Do something that would use futures, for example, or, or the, the synchronous callbacks, but any of my callbacks can be called at any point. Uh, yeah, so uh, th this is uh, an important observation. Our code here before was uh, asynchronous, but in some sense sequential. Like here, I could never, uh, I always have to execute the write after the read, and only after I've executed this write, I can execute the next read. So it is a, a, a fixed sequence, and this is why I was able to change this into a coroutine. If, because this is what are, you, you are asking for. If you have a fork, like you want to execute a number of asynchronous things in parallel or have a more complicated flow, this is where coroutines will not help you. <laughs> this is where you have to go to another uh, asynchrony model, a one that will hopefully be provided in C++26. <laughs> Any more ideas, comments or questions, please? Yeah, one over there, please, in the second row. I'm uh, curious, um, what would be, in your opinion, an ergonomic way of handling cancellation? And I'm not talking about uh, failure or, of one of the uh, paths in, in, in the coroutines, but actual on-purpose cancellation. For exa example, a subsequent task uh, implies cancelling something that is in flight. I didn't get the last part, but basically this is about the cancellation, when you want to cancel at uh, random points. Yes. For example, while uh, some part of the coroutine is in the process of uh, working, uh, it might decide to cancel a an, an next operation. So it, it ties into the logic of the program, not the failure. OK, so because uh, the coroutine itself, you cannot just pause at any random point. You have to pause the, it at those co-await moments. And suppose this is happens, that you co-await, the coroutine is suspended, and now you are back. Maybe this is what you're asking for. You are back to the main uh, program flow, and you decide that you no longer want to work with this coroutine. You're no lo longer interested in its results. Now, a lot of stuff we cannot see here because this awaitable is defined for us here. And this is where uh, whoever gets to implement it has to make a, a call what to do. This library and probably any other, what it will do, there is a function which uh, I don't even know. It's destroy, I think, that it will call uh, function destroy. And hopefully what uh, it will ultimately do it will destroy the automatic objects of your t uh, or, or that you have defined 
in here, like a socket, like uh, any automatic uh, variables, but otherwise you can just uh, forget it. this uh, coroutine. It will never be returned to again. Uh, it will be that its frame will be <coughs> deallocated, which means that whenever you uh, uh, execute this uh, coroutine body, you have to be prepared that it may be your last go away because someone else from the outside may decide no longer to, uh, what's the word here, resume you. The, there will be this trivial resumption to destroy the automatic objects, but that's it. Any, any other operations will be skipped as if you throw an, uh, an exception, except that you cannot catch it. Lovely, perfect. Andrzej, thank you so much for your detailed uh, presentation and for the answers to all the questions. Andrzej Krzemiński, everyone. Thank you.